G'day there, guys. <laughs> G'day, everyone. This is like take 74, but anyway, we will get there. Welcome to part two of our off-grid power systems as part of our off-grid travel series that we're doing at the moment with our mates from Everything Caravaning and Camping. You can grab yourself a $100 voucher just by watching this video, details at the end of the video of how you can win that. We want to announce, though, the winner of the $100 voucher from our video that we did a couple of weeks ago, the first part of the off-grid power systems. So congratulations to Barry Dyer. Dyer? Dyer. Dyer. Barry, Barry Dyer. Dyer. Congratulations, congratulations Barry. Barry Dyer. You're the winner. Uh, we'll leave a comment on your comment and uh, we'll send you a message. If you could just email us, uh, Simon at the Lifestyle Pioneers, we'll flick you the, uh, the voucher and send it your way. Yeah. Happy shopping. Simon at the Lifestyle That's what that's what she meant. That's what I meant. <laughs> or send right. us a message on socials. Barry, we know you're all out there pretty regularly following what we do. So yeah, send us a message on socials or, or get in touch some way and we'll make sure you get that $100 voucher. And we can't wait to see what you get your hands on. Thousands of products there on the website to choose from. So it'll be interesting to see what you choose. Yeah, all right. This episode, Power Systems. Yeah, so this one, if you haven't watched our previous Power Systems video, probably go and watch that one first because that's going to explain a lot of the terminology and a lot of what we're talking about and the concepts, uh, how we, how you go about specking a, an off-grid power system to suit your needs and the way you want to travel. In this one, we're going to be using our caravan and our off-grid power system as a bit of a case study to show how it all works in the real world, what your consumption's likely to be, how we use our power, what our consumption is, how we store it, how we get it back, uh, what works well, what doesn't, what we got right, what we didn't. Uh, is it big enough? Is it not big enough? Power saving tips. Yeah, everything like that we're going to be sharing in this one. Thank you again for everyone who left us all your comments and questions and everything from the last video. We're really enjoying that side of what we're doing at the moment is all that feedback. And this is becoming a really good resource for everyone to, to learn from. So really thank you for everyone who did that. Uh, with the power system, the first one we did, one of the big uh, things that we did forget to mention or didn't really sort of touch on was how much power your inverter will draw just when it's sitting at idle, just being on. Inverters draw a varying amount of power depending on the size of the inverter and, and probably the brand and type. As an example, our 2600 watt inverter will draw about three or four amps an hour just at idle, just, um, just sitting there. So it's not really viable to have your inverter running 24 seven. So how much that three or four amps affects you is really gonna depend on how many hours a day you need to run that inverter. For example, if you're running your coffee machine like ours, we can make our coffee in about 10 minutes. So that three or four amps that that, uh, that inverter draws per hour is really not that relevant in that 10 minutes, particularly when you consider that that coffee machine itself is drawing probably 130 amps. So the three or four amps extra that the inverter is running isn't a consideration. However, when it comes to keeping our laptops charged and needing to run the inverter for long periods of time to charge the laptops, uh, or say, for example, if you have a CPAP machine that run, needs to run off 240 volt, when it's starting to run for eight, 10 hours, that's when it really does start to add up. So that it is something worth keeping in mind. Another point that came through in your comments on the last video is something that I probably didn't spend enough time pointing out clearly, is that when we're talking about the storage in a battery system, and I'm talking that you may have, say, for example, a 100 amp battery, that, is, that means that that battery is capable of delivering 100 amps per hour. So it can deliver 100 amps for one hour and it's dead flat, or it can deliver one amp for 100 hours until it's dead flat. So it's all about power over time or over a period of time. And in the same way, when we're talking about devices or appliances drawing power from that system, even an appliance or a device uses, as an example, 10 amps, it's drawing 10 amps of power per hour. So from that 100 amp battery, you could run that for 10 hours. 10 hours, 10 amps equals 100, right? In theory, but as we said, you can't run batteries 100% flat. So for example, if that was a lithium, 100 amp battery, we can use 80 amps of that 100 amps. So a 10 amp device after eight hours would take your 100 amp battery down to its 20%. I hope that makes sense. I probably didn't explain that well enough in the first one. So it is worth noting that that is how uh, battery power is calculated or, or expressed is in amps per hour. All right, so let's just quickly recap how we live. So Simon and I and our two boys, we live in a 20 foot six caravan, majority of the time off grid. So what do I mean by that? The last two years, so we are pretty much coming up to bang on two years. Our first year of travel, we spent 17 nights plugged into power 
and seven of those were during a COVID lockdown. So, and we, that was the only site we could get. So in, when I looked at the campsite stats, only twice did we plug into power because we were actually running low and needed to recharge our batteries. So the other times it was we were visiting major cities and things like that, or the caravan site that we wanted to, the caravan park that we wanted to stay in didn't offer an unpowered site. The second year, we spent a lot more nights on powered sites. Most of those when we were filming for a TV show and they were paid for, so thanks, <laughs> thanks to those guys. And the rest of it, it was, we spent a little bit more time because there was a lot more rainy days. Uh, we had that ill Nina year and it was just crazy hectic weather. And so we did have to plug in a lot more this year. So yeah, about 30 days of the year. So that's a bit of our background, a bit of our experience. So over 600 nights living off grid, not connected to a PowerPoint, not connected to a water tap, uh, just yeah, living unplugged from the world. So let's have a look at uh, what are our power needs. What do we, what devices do we run? What do we use in our caravan? And remembering that this is not for us a camping adventure. This is our home that we live in, like full time. We don't have a house to go back to. Uh, it's a lot of these things, some people go, oh, that's not even camping or, you know, that's such a luxury item. For us, this is our home. And these are the things that we live with every day. All right, let's look at some of the things that we have in our caravan that help us live off grid as a family of four. So at the heart of our power needs, like almost every setup these days is always going to be the fridge. You've got to keep the beers cold and probably should keep some food in there as well. So the fridge or whatever fridge you're running is going to be probably the basis of your power system. At the bare minimum, most of us want to be able to run our fridge. After that's going to come a lot of our other DC loads. So our lights, uh, our water pump, being able to recharge our phones and our, and our iPads and everything like that. So all the DC loads, which are our 12 volt, uh, DC loads. That's going to give you the basis of your power draw. Add in some some lights. We don't find lights and things used a lot because you're not using them very often. You're only using them for a few hours of an evening and they don't draw very much. Uh, especially in our van we've got these LED strip lights and they really draw very little. About an amp each, something like that. So on average maybe five or ten amps a night depending on how much we're using the lights uh, is going to be our draw from that. Our fridge uses about six amps an hour on average. So six amps, 24 hours, pretty simple to work out how much power we need to run that in every 24 hour period. So the big things that we expect our system to be able to run are those bigger AC loads. So they're the 240 volt loads. Obviously then we needed to have an inverter installed. So we spec an inverter for our setup. Big ones for us is cooking. Uh, it's the induction cooker for us is, is our go-to and our thermomix. I cannot believe he missed the biggest appliance that oh. we use. And, and, <laughs> and we did this in the first power video. We completely <laughs> forgot to mention it. Can you guess what it is? Crazy. And no one picked us up on it either. No one picked us up. It's like you don't even watch us. You don't even know us well. I couldn't believe it. Our coffee machine. Coffee machine. <laughs> That oh. gets a workout. Now, when we started, we had a pod machine and a, an electric milk frother, um, and now we've upgraded to the bigger machine. I am getting hammered by March flies. We, yeah, anyway, coffee, so, coffee, coffee machine. machine. Obviously, we use that uh, for a few hours a day. No, we use it for a few minutes every day, a couple of times a day often, uh, but yeah. We have at least two coffees a day each. Yeah. Uh, microwave's another one. We use it extremely rarely. Uh, we're actually considering getting rid of our microwave uh, to save weight and to replace it with something else special that's going to go into our kitchen soon. Uh, save yeah. it to the end. Save it to the end. Oh, I don't even know. We'll let the cat out of the bag in this video. We'll see. Yeah, see how I feel. Them know. If we're feeling generous. So, yeah, so we're thinking about getting rid of the microwave because we don't even use it that much. But yeah. that is if you are someone who would like to use that, air fryers, Washing all that machine. sort of stuff. So, let's talk about the things that we don't have. Yeah, so we don't have an air fryer. I know that might sound crazy, but a lot of people are carrying air fryers these days. We don't have a washing, washing machine. machine. They draw a lot of power. And a lot of water, which is the, yeah. the bigger reason for us not getting one was the weight of it and the water that it used. Yeah, so when we were doing our, specking our van, we had a weight budget and a financial budget. And both, like if any inclusion that we had, had to stack up weight and financially. Um, and at the time, the washing machine didn't make the mustard. No, it was, and it was really because of that water usage. Yeah. And, and the weight was, yeah, anyway, yeah. we said that. But anyway. anyway, go watch the weights video. Yep. 
somewhere. Yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave something somewhere for that. <laughs> Simon will leave that somewhere yeah. for you. Thanks for that, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so if that is all our AC loads covered, let's go in, let's dive in and have a look at how much each of these actually draw and then how much a day that we sort of allow for them to be used and therefore how much power they're going to be taking out of our system so that we can start to get an idea of what our average overall daily uh, power needs are. So to give you some idea, with our 400 amp battery system, if we've been at 100% the day before, for by the time either the solar input has come to an end or we've pulled up at camp, if we've only just arrived at camp, so assuming we're at 100%, our batteries are normally down to around 86, 87%. So we're, just our overnight consumption of just our, our standard sort of loads, we're using about 13% or just over 50 amps of our 400 amp battery system. Where is that power being consumed? Well, number one is going to be the fridge behind me, that running overnight. So obviously it's going to vary a little bit depending on the weather and things like that. But I would say 13% or 50 amps is about our average. Lights, uh, obviously the night before we would have run a few lights and things like that. Charging phones overnight. That's generally though without having done any electric cooking. So that's without having used induction or thermomix or anything like that to do any cooking. If we've done any of that, it's likely to be a bit lower and we'll go into that in a minute, how much that uses. But just to give you some idea, we're gonna run down to about 50 amps below whatever we started with by the morning, uh, just on an average night. So what else uses battery power in our 24 hours? Well, first thing in the morning, every morning, this bad boy gets started up. Our coffee machine, and often twice. Now it's 10 o'clock in the morning now, and you'll notice it's still on the bench. That's because it's a bit early to commit to only one coffee. There may be, may be a need for a second coffee. So this big bad boy is a Breville Ingenio. No, it's not. It's a Breville no, Barista not. Impress Express. No, yeah. Breville Barista Express, Express Impress, Impress is out. In truffle black. I'll leave a link below. It's the best things in slow. <laughs> so we love this coffee machine. It's relatively new to us. We've had it about six months now. Uh, and this big boy obviously is about as big probably as a coffee machine you would have in a caravan, I think. I'd be surprised. Let me know though, if there's anyone out there traveling with a bigger one, I'll be impressed. Uh, this thing uses a fair bit of juice, but for a relatively short period of time. So when it's pumping and, and heating and doing everything all at once, it's gonna be pulling about 120 amps out of our batteries. Now, if that ran for an hour, that'd pull 120 amps out of our batteries in that, hundred, in that one hour, because it's 120 amps per hour. But obviously we don't use it for that amount of time. What I find with the coffee machine, to give you an idea, to make two coffees uses about 2% uh, of our batteries. So about eight amps, eight to 10 amps, 10 if I'm making them a bit slower. The quicker you are at making them, the less power you use because it's heating, the, heating up for less time. So I'm always trying to be as quick as I can. Uh, but yeah, that gives you an idea. That uses, only uses about eight amps. So yeah, a couple of percent of our batteries. If we have two coffees, obviously double that, as in two coffees each. We always have two coffees, one each. But yeah, if we have two coffees each, double that. All right, now, next thing is dishes. If we know we're gonna have reasonably good solar conditions and we're gonna be able to replenish power <coughs> relatively easily, we'll use our induction plate uh, to heat water to do dishes. Rather than using our gas hot water system or heating on the gas stove, we save gas wherever possible because that costs us money and it's we've gotta then go and find somewhere to refill that gas. So we're always as frugal as possible with our gas. So we use electric wherever possible to heat water. So let's whip out the, we're about to do the dishes. So let's do a little test. We'll grab out the induction. We'll boil some water up and we'll give you an idea of how much power is coming out of the batteries at that moment that it's running, but then also roughly what the total consumption is of boiling a pot of water to do dishes to give you guys an idea. All right, so I've just set that to boil on our uh, induction plate, which cranked it right up to 1800 watts consumption. It's close enough to 150 amps heap of power that that's drawing when it's sitting at 1800 watts. But that's not really the case because what we find is not only do you not normally cook something for that long, but if you are cooking for something for that long, it's generally only simmering or something like that. So you're not drawing anywhere near 1800 watts. Now what you'll also find is the induction will cycle in the similar way to your fridge will. So it'll click in and click out to maintain a temperature. So it'll draw a fair bit of power when it clicks in and then it'll turn off and only draw a tiny bit of power and then in, on, off, on, off. The amount that it clicks on and off and the amount of power it draws when it does depends on what setting it is and how hot you're trying to keep things. But in general, what we find is for a half hour cook, on average to cook a meal, you know, if you're making up a spag bowl sauce or something like that, 
even if you're letting that simmer for half an hour, say after you've after you've cooked it, how much power do we use? Oh, you put me on the spot. So for a half hour cook on either the thermomix or the induction, I it, we generally use between ten and thirteen percent of our overall battery, which is what about yeah. So so ten to thirteen percent. So it's going to be between forty and fifty amps of our battery storage um, is going to be used in cooking dinner or, or lunch or whatever the meal is. So what we find is like this sort of said in there is that the induction, we're not going to get the Thermomix out today, but the induction and the Thermomix use a very similar amount of power to cook an average meal, which is what I think is really important. Obviously in su some meals, it's not hard to work out, are going to use less uh, if, if it's running for less time and doesn't have to get as hot. Some are going to use more, but in general, 40 to 50 amps is what it's going to take to cook a meal on uh, on the induction or on the Thermomix. Okay, so according to Liz's stopwatch, <laughs> we're just we're just gone about the four and a half minute mark, and you can see that water there. It's not boiling yet, but it's just starting to bubble. Now that's about as much as we'd normally heat it up for dishes. I don't know, that's maybe 80 degrees or something like that. Now that's generally hot enough, especially to do a small amount of dishes like we're doing this morning, just our brekkie and coffee dishes, but. We've used about 3% of our battery, or about 12 amps so far to do that in that in that few minutes. So you can see while it's running really hard and trying to you know, heat something up, it does it does consume quite a lot of power. But what you'll find is as it hits that boiling point and it's only maintaining the boil, you could turn it right down and it'd use way less. So it's just started boiling just over five and a half minutes, uh, five minutes and 41 seconds. And we used, yeah, used 4% in the end. So about, about 15, 16 amps. <clears throat> around that mark to boil some water. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of what some of these bigger 240 volt appliances use. So aside from those, our next biggest current draw is this thing, our air conditioner, which yes, we can run off grid and run off our batteries and it will run off our inverter. Uh, our inverter is a 2600 watt inverter and it will run the air conditioner quite comfortably. Uh, it will use about, on average, 80 amps an hour. Uh, you'll find once it cools the van down, it, it really drops down and starts to use 60-ish amps is, is what I see on average uh, per hour that that air conditioner is running. So it's pretty easy to do those sums on that one. I mean, at 80 amps, assuming it was really hot and the air conditioner was working really hard, you would find that in four hours, four eight to 32, 320 amps, out of our 400, that's starting to get pretty, pretty close to using up everything we've got. There's no way we'd run it for that long. That being said, with our van, we find with the insulation in the van, we don't generally need to run it anywhere near that long. Uh, on a hot evening, we will occasionally run it for an hour, hour and a half, just to cool the van down so the kids can get to sleep and it just takes the edge off. A fair bit of juice, but generally keep in mind, if you're it's hot enough that you need to run your air conditioner, Generally, there's really good solar conditions. So there's a trade-off there. And in sometimes in the middle of the day, we can be getting close to half, if not half that amount of power that we're using with the air conditioner back into the batteries with solar. Another cool handy tip with your air conditioning is if you are traveling in hot weather, stop somewhere a half an hour to an hour before you're gonna pull up for camp, turn your inverter on and turn your air conditioner on while you're driving. A lot of people say you can't do it, We've done it a number of times. It does work. Uh, I haven't spoken to any experts to tell me if there's any reason that you shouldn't do that, that it's going to damage anything. I can't see anything wrong with it, but it bloody works. And the brilliance of it is when you pull up in camp, then your van is perfect and cold. You jump out of the air conditioned car straight into the air conditioned van. It's perfect luxury. But it also means that if you're going to keep running that air conditioner for a couple of hours after you've pulled up, it's already done the hard work of cooling the van down and the power draw that's going to come from that uh, from that air conditioner is gonna be significantly lower. So it works really well, highly recommend it. So the other time we'll use the air conditioner is if middle of the day, it's really hot, we wanna have a break inside and we're at 100% battery power, we've got a heap of solar coming in, we can run the air conditioner for an hour say, and an hour after we turn it off, we're back to 100%. So it's, yeah, it, it can be very efficient in that sense. The biggest one that we underestimated, the biggest one we got wrong uh, was well, we got it wrong, but there's reasons for that, is how much power our laptops use. Now, when I say there's reasons for why we got it wrong, uh, although we set out from day one knowing we we're gonna edit and create a YouTube channel and, and edit videos, I didn't really have any understanding of how much power or how 
demanding that is on your laptop or on your computers. It uses a stack of power. And as I said, you've also got to add to that the residual power of the inverter running while I'm trying to charge that. So with the inverter running and charging my battery while I'm editing, I can be drawing over 10 amps an hour out of our batteries. Now that might not sound like a lot, but if you think about four, five, six hours of editing, that can start to pull a fair bit of power out of our system, particularly if we're not getting a lot of regeneration in from our solar. Yeah. So that's actually become our biggest consideration for power in the last 12 months while we've been traveling in those areas that have been quite overcast regularly, uh, rainy, a lot of shaded campsites and deep in valleys in the mountains and things like that. That's really started to be a big consideration for us. Now, although many of you out there probably aren't gonna start a YouTube channel and start editing videos on your laptop and things like that, these days it is becoming more and more common to work on the road and of course, kids and schoolwork and their school needs. Now, depending on what school program you've gone with and how they're gonna be consuming that, you might find that uh, they'd be using a laptop or at the very least an iPad for a few hours every day. So that does start to add up into your power needs, uh, being able to run those. And then the other big one, which I'm not gonna get into a heap of detail here, but becoming more common again is Starlink. Starlink internet, uh, satellite internet is again becoming more and more common. We're seeing more and more travelers uh, are using Starlink. We've actually, there's one of those blowflies again. We've actually just purchased Starlink. Uh, I haven't even taken it out of the box yet. So I can't, certainly can't speak into its power needs, but we are gonna be doing an upcoming video that's gonna be all about communications and how we get internet while we live off grid because we think that these days, that's a really big topic is is day-to-day -day living off grid. Many of us, uh, and us included, need regular and reliable access to the internet. So that's gonna be coming up in the off grid series, an upcoming video. Again, make sure you subscribe if you wanna catch that one. But I'll go into more detail then once we've used the Starlink a bit more and got a bit more experience with its power consumption. Unless you go and start cutting cables and doing some uh, backyard modifications, which a lot of people are doing, you will need 240 volt power to run your Starlink. Uh, now, while it may not draw a lot on its own, I believe it's around five amps an hour that the Starlink uses it on its own because obviously you're running that inverter. Depending on what inverter you're running, you may be almost doubling that consumption just in that residual uh, that your inverter is using. So you might be pulling you know, close to 10 amps an hour out of your batteries just to run your Starlink internet. So that's certainly something to keep in mind. Replenishing that system is our solar. Solar is by far your best friend when you want to survive off-grid or spend long periods off-grid uh, and keep your power system topped up. It's completely silent, uh, it's completely free once you've purchased it, uh, and it just works so well across most conditions, across most of the country. So I really can't recommend enough having as much solar really as you possibly can. We have up here four of these Enerdrive 180 watt solar panels. So 720 watts of power potentially in total. We'll talk more about that downstairs when I get down to the charging system. But as I said in our last video, you will never see 100% of your panels rating coming into your battery system. Uh, it's just not the way solar works, unfortunately. The only downside to having a lot of solar is it is, can be heavy. These glass panels in particular, the weight does start to add up. So you do need to be aware of that. Uh, and obviously the cost. But other than that, you really wanna have as much solar as possible for your, uh, for your system. Particularly if you wanna stay in the one spot for a long time or for extended periods and not be moving around and relying on that alternator to charge your batteries. Alrighty, so our charging system is in under our seat here, which is also our pantry. <laughs> <laughs> so our inverter's buried down in there as well. I don't necessarily recommend storing all your food around your charging system, but uh, we just did a restock, so we're pretty well chockers, and uh, we might have might have overdone it a little bit. But anyway, we do often store stuff around there. I, I don't know that I'd recommend it. it gets, uh, that inverter gets really hot, uh, and the charging it gets hot, so it really should have good airflow around it, and you've got to be careful of what you store there. Because uh, Liz put a... <laughs> accidentally put a bag of marshmallows next to the inverter one day and we had one big marshmallow, it was delicious. 
So the number one way, as I said in our previous power video, if you've watched that, I might be doubling up on things a little bit here, but it's really worth understanding charges and charging systems because it's probably one of the least understood and one of the most crucial components to your system. You can have all the solar in the world, have a great big alternator and pump a heap of charge in and a nice big battery system. But at the end of the day, if you're not efficiently getting that power from those charging sources back into your batteries, then you're wasting time and money and you're just not getting the most out of your system that you possibly could. So let's talk about that. One of the big things that people underestimate, I think, is charging rates of the chargers. What do I mean by that? Well, how much charge can that charger put back into your batteries at its maximum capacity? So making sure that your charges are adequate for whatever battery system and charging system you've chosen, as far as what replenishment options you've gone with, making sure that your charge is up to the task of bringing in all that solar power, all that alternator power, and maximizing the amount of power that's going into your batteries. There's no point having a huge big battery system if you cannot get that power back in. Now, a lot of systems out there are getting quite big as far as battery systems are going these days. A lot of people are going six, eight, 900 amp hour battery systems. Beautiful big battery systems, and I'm I'm all for it. I'm not against having a big battery system, but you just need to be careful when you're starting to go that big in your battery system that you're able to get that power back in. So what we did with our system is we added an extra solar charger or solar controller. Ours is an Enerdrive 40 amp MPPT charger. It's one of their newer ones. They brought them out last year, I think, uh, was when they first came out. And that's been absolutely gold for managing our solar charge separate to the alternator charge from the vehicle. So what that now means is <clears throat> that solar controller that we've installed now handles all of our solar power from our fixed panels and our roof. Our DC DC charger now, its role is just to take that alternator charge from the vehicle and put that into the batteries. It will also take any portable solar panels uh, that we plug into that additional solar, uh, Anderson plug. So what that means now is that if we're parked up and just getting solar in, that solar charger, that 40 amp charger can handle just that roof load. If we plug in an additional external portable solar blanket where we're, we, that we're just starting to use, you might've seen us in that previous video, we've just gotten our first ever portable solar panel and we're starting to test that out and see how much of a difference that makes. That's a 200 watt blanket. Its charge will go through that DC DC charger. The biggest advantage to it though by far is that it means when we're driving, we can see up to 80 amps of charge going into our system coming because we're getting a huge amount of, or our maximum amount we can from our roof solar, whatever we're getting at the time, as well as that charge coming from the vehicle. It makes a huge difference when you're trying to replenish uh, a larger battery system because obviously you're getting a heap more charge than that, what that 50 amp or 40 amp DC DC charger is capable of on its own. Power saving tips. If we are running low on our batteries, what things do we do to conserve power to make sure that we've got enough to get by? Turn the bloody inverter <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, Number don't... one is Simon is like a stickler <laughs> for checking the batteries. Is I open the caravan door, I walk in, and he's like, What's the battery doing? I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, opening a window he's like how do you not check the inverter oh, i'll tell you what the guy the legends at burke's backyard you guys did a great little reel on socials uh oh. short little video uh taking the piss a little bit out of uh all of us off-grid travelers who spend way too much time monitoring our batteries how much solar we're getting in uh how much power <laughs> consumption you know making sure the kids are shutting the fridge and all these sorts of things oh you guys gosh. did a cracking job because it was absolutely spot on I that's exactly the whole what it's way like. through that is simon to a t if you haven't seen it go look up burke's backyard on Burks, B-I-R-K-S, backyard on uh, on Instagram. Facebook or Instagram and find their reel that they did. It's a, it's a pisser. It's, it's a genuine representation of life on the road. Is number one, just diligence, checking what you're using, checking um, where your battery is so you have a good idea. And also, something we're really terrible at, but do as we say, not as we do, is <laughs> check the weather forecast. Yeah. Often we'll have a beautiful sunny day, Use we'll heaps, of, heaps power. of power, and then we don't realise that we're in for a week of rain yeah. and we should have conserved power on that first day. That's so, happened way more times than it should have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. As I said, do as we say, not as we do. Yeah. Um, other things that we do to conserve power uh, if we're ever sitting at 100% during the middle of the day and we've got solar... 100% battery, she oh, Sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah. sorry. 100% batteries at the middle of the day and we're getting solar in and it's going nowhere, doing nothing, is I will do things like cook dinner at lunchtime 
and then put it in that thermo server bowl. I think we showed you that last a, time. Last yep. time in a previous video, so that dinner's cooked, and then we're regenerating. So we're back at 100 percent when it's this when the sun's going down. So because then, as Simon said, we'll probably use somewhere between 10 and 13 percent overnight, running lights, batteries, laptops, whatever we're using. Yep. So then we're only down to about 87 percent when we wake up, compared to say being at 77. Um, if we also cooked dinner. So, so the, I think I think the, the main point to get across there is just consider if you're reaching 100% battery storage uh, and there's still good solar yield coming in, so it's still close to the middle of the day or, or early afternoon and there's plenty of solar coming in, think about ways that you can use that power because all that solar is effectively going to waste. It's not doing anything, it's keeping your batteries topped up, but there's a lot of potential power there that you could be using that's virtually free power basically and you'll still reach 100% before the sun goes down for the day or close to it. Yep. So electric cooking is a big one for us that we use if you can heat water on electric maybe think about you know heating water and having a shower of an afternoon rather than an evening or a morning uh just just thinking about different ways that you can use up some power doing a lot of washing a lot of washing we don't yeah. have a washing machine but i know a lot of people use their uh washing machine leave us comments below if there's things that you use um Power. What, what, what do you use your power what's your, for? What's your guilty pleasure using power yeah. for when you've got plenty of power? I like to make um, like a, what is it called? I rice don't know. pudding. I love to make rice pudding when we've got heaps of power. It's just this great thermomix recipe. It uses about 40, it goes for about 40 minutes. Yeah. It does use a lot of power, but it's perfect hot or cold. It's in the fridge, it's a snack, and it's only uses uh, long life staples. So yeah. that's that's a cracker for us. Another another big save, power saving tip is your fridge. Your fridge will use a lot of power. So make sure your fridge isn't turned up, as in turned down, depending how you look at it, as in <laughs> set to the co any colder than you need it to be. Uh, we find when we're traveling in the cooler climates, you don't need to have the fridge turned uh, down or up. <laughs> I don't know what the best way to say it is. Set any colder or set anywhere near as cold as what we do when we're obviously up in the tropics. And the other thing with that is that obviously when you're in those cooler climates, you're probably getting a lower solar yield. So it helps to balance that out a little bit. Make sure the fridge is closed properly. Make sure the kids are giving it a good shove and kept yeah. it closed. If you've got um, openable vents like we do with our caravan, we can open a vent at the back of the caravan to allow more airflow in. Doing that as much as possible. Just helping the fridge out as much as you can. Keeping in mind too, a full fridge runs a lot more efficiently than an empty one. Uh, so don't keep it cranked to a really cold setting with only a handful of things in there. You will start to use a lot of power. So even if you can put water bottles and things like that in your fridge, it will actually help it to use less power uh, because cooling liquids and solids is a lot more efficient than cooling air. Yeah. In general, we're just always being aware of keeping things turned off whenever we don't need them to save power. When we leave the van to go out for a day trip or anything like that, we make sure absolutely everything is turned off other than the fridge. It may only save a few amps over a day, but it all adds up, trust me, when you start to have those residual loads. If the kids have left something plugged in, lights on, things like that, and you leave them on all day while you're out and about, it starts to add up. Yeah, so something else we do is if we're running the inverter for, um, say I'm cooking dinner, is we'll also go and make sure we've charged, uh, we've got, we'll also go and make sure we've got all our laptops plugged in and using it at the same time just to because of that residual load that the inverter uses, because yeah. it's going to be pulling three or four amps as it's running anyway, we might as well, while it's on, charge up everything that needs to be charged up, use any 240 volt power and trying to use it all at the same time so that the inverter is just running for fewer hours over the day. All right, so big question, is it enough? 400 amps of batteries, is it enough for what we do? Um, yes, in short, for most circumstances that we've been in. Definitely for that first 12, 18 months of travel where we spent most of the time following the sun and spending time up north, 400 amps was adequate. Uh, and the 720 watts of solar on the roof, I would say was adequate. We've become quite good at adapting our power needs and changing what we use um, based on the weather. We used to be a lot more flexible with how much we could use our laptops, but that as our business is growing, we need them more and more. So we're finding that we do need to just use them regardless what our battery's doing. Yeah, and no, that's also coincided with traveling in areas like Tasmania and the Kosciuszko where just solar hasn't been as available. So I think there's definitely been a combination of factors there. By far and away though, as I sort of touched on when I was talking about solar, 
our 400 amps is is adequate. If any, if I was going to spend money on anything, it would be more replenishment, more solar, and just going as much solar as possible. I think 400 amps of lithium is adequate for most people, uh, or more than adequate for a lot of people, uh, particularly if you're willing to use gas for cooking uh, if and where you need to as your backup option. Uh, once you remove that backup option, if you wanted to go full electric cooking or only electric cooking, I think you would struggle with only 400 amps and only 720 watts of solar. Uh, and as we've sort of said, for 90% for of it, yes, it's been adequate. We're starting to think we might want a bit more now as our needs for business grow and as we want to travel into some areas that have lower solar yield. But yeah, by far in general, if you'd ask us, I'm glad we didn't do this video 12 months in, put it that way, because if we'd yeah. done this video 12 months after our sorry, 12 months into our travels, uh, we definitely would have said to you, oh, it's ample, it's way more than, I can't understand why you would ever need more because <laughs> we were never wanting for power. So that Word. if you're gonna do a similar trip where you do a lap of Australia or something like that, or a half lap, and you're gonna spend the winter up north, summer down south, and you're gonna spend a lot of time in the outback, you probably find uh, you go, you're not gonna need anywhere near as much uh, regeneration or power storage or as big a power system in general as what you're going to need if you want to go and spend time in the Vic High Country camping uh, on the coast in amongst the trees, shady nice, nice campsites, in the rainforest, places yeah. like that. So it really does come down to how and where you're going to travel. Yeah. Alright guys, hope this one's really helped you out understand uh, our battery system and how it works for us and if you want to travel similar to us you might be able to get some idea of how big a system you might need and just some of those real world examples of how much consumption we have, how we go about regenerating and how much regeneration we get from our solar and things like that. So, Hope you've enjoyed this one guys. The next uh, off-grid video that's gonna be coming out in two weeks time will be our safety and security video. This is a huge topic, one that we got a heap of questions about. So many questions. Can't wait to share all our uh, thoughts and ideas on that and really looking forward to your engagement with that. Please continue to leave us comments and get engaged with these videos. It's really, uh, it's really enjoyable for us. We love that these videos are gonna become a resource for travelers uh, and, and people who wanna spend time off grid to, to figure out what uh, is gonna suit their needs. So really appreciate that guys. And next week is gonna be the next installment of our Tasmania travels in our travel vlog. Looking forward to bringing that one as well. Uh, yeah, and good luck in the competition. We'll be announcing in two weeks time the, uh, the, the winner. winner of the next $100 voucher. Yeah, so just remember all you have to do for that is subscribe, leave us a comment below and go sign up to the Everything Caravanning Camping newsletter which is in the um, description below. Link down there in the description. Thanks for your time guys. Hope you enjoyed this one as we said and we will see you next Sunday. See you Sunday.